This episode contains real, narrated experiences. Listener discretion is advised. Good evening, and welcome into Disturbed. This week, I've got four true experiences that are sure to give you a good scare. So come on in and join me as we explore the realm of true horror. first experience comes from Reddit user Dreams Child, and I'm proud to introduce new guest narrator Erin Lillis. You may recognize her from the No Sleep podcast. This experience has been independently verified by Reddit's team through supporting evidence and has been given the exclusive verified tag. Many times... It's one decision that can change everything. When I was a teenager, I was goth. Black hair, black clothes, black makeup, even had a pair of combat boots. My friends and I, in typical goth fashion, hung out at the local cemetery. We started going as a joke, but soon discovered we liked the peace we found there. That all changed one night. My friend called to see if I wanted to hang out, and I did. None of our other friends were available. They were either working or recovering from partying the night before, so we were on our own. My friend picked me up, and we drove up to the cemetery. We were hanging out, smoking cigs, and BSing about the latest issues she was having with her boyfriend. When we noticed at the top of the hill we were on, about 100 feet away... A bonfire had been lit. You have to understand that this cemetery is about a block off campus of a major university, and it's not uncommon for college students to go there to party. My friend and I sighed, knowing that we would have to get going soon. It was illegal to be in the cemetery after dark, and we knew the police would show up because some jerks had decided they needed a bonfire. We decided to finish our cigs and then take off. Just then, the most horrible stench came wafting down the hill from the direction of the bonfire. My friend gagged and covered her mouth. I groaned and said, what the hell? My friend shook her head, saying, I don't know what they're doing, let's just leave. We get in the car, and one of us suggested, I honestly don't remember who, maybe we should just go up and see what they're doing. My stomach turned, and a cold shiver went through my body. My friend must have had the same feeling because at the same time, we both said, no, we should leave. My friend turned the car on, switched on her headlights, put the car in reverse, and looked over her shoulder before starting to back up. I was still looking up the hill. A figure stepped in front of the bonfire. I could only see a silhouette, but I was sure whoever it was was watching us. A feeling of terror hit me, and I said, go, 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 go! getting louder and more panicked with each word. My friend looked back up the hill for a second, and just as the figure took a step towards us, she slammed on the gas and peeled out, going in reverse down the hill. She rammed the gear shift into drive, and we were out. We didn't say anything for a while, until she said, What the hell were they burning? I shook my head. I don't know. She dropped me off at home, and I went to bed. The next morning, I woke up and went out to the kitchen. My mom was there, drinking her morning coffee, and I joined her. We talked about her job for a bit, when she suddenly comes out with, Did you hear what happened last night? I shrug and say no, i just gotten up. She tells me that a woman she worked with was kidnapped from the parking garage. Oh my god, I say. Did they find her? Yes, but too late, she replied. Whoever took her had raped and murdered her. They found her this morning up in the cemetery. He had tried to dispose of her body in a bonfire. I froze. My brain was going a mile a minute, the realization slowly creeping up. 
that's what that smell was. Needless to say, I never hung out at the cemetery at night again. I think back to our decision to leave instead of investigating the fire. That one decision could have changed everything. Dark silhouette in the bonfire? Let's not meet. If you enjoy what you're hearing, consider supporting us as a premium listener. Premium listeners enjoy perks like shoutouts, early ad-free episodes, merch store discounts, and bonus episodes. Find out more at disturbedpodcast.com slash fan club. In our next experience, we meet Reddit user Botanically A. Barry. With narration by Nicole Goodnight. When something gives you a bad feeling, you should always trust your gut. I don't know what compelled me to finally share this, but... I have been thinking about it a lot the past few days and thought it'd fit this sub relatively well. I'm one of those longtime lurkers who have been sitting on their own story for ages, but I finally got around to writing my experience down and hope someone out there finds this interesting to read. Apologies in advance for the length. I have a lot of thoughts about this as if it was the first and only time I felt legitimately afraid for my life. When I was about eight years old, my parents were going through a divorce, and me and my older sister used to spend a lot of time at our grandparents' house. It's a long, ranch-style home on a corner in a very nice neighborhood that's a ten-minute walk from a gas station, grocery store, and a few fast-food restaurants. The streets are long and lined with well-manicured houses cradled by big, scenic California Valley hills all around. We were never very wealthy, but my grandpa bought it as a fixer-upper many years ago, and the property value has skyrocketed since then. As you can imagine, it's a very safe spot, and although there weren't many other kids in the neighborhood, it wasn't uncommon to see neighbors walking their dogs or pushing a stroller down the sidewalk outside our house. Although my mom was especially protective all our lives, this particular neighborhood was densely populated, and my family knew just about everyone who lived there. She grew up in that neighborhood herself, so she was understandably trusting. She would once in a while let me and my sister walk to the Rotten Robbie gas station on the other end of the block to grab a snack. I would always get a ring pop. And my sister? My sister would grab a Three Musketeers before we made our way back home. My sister was about 11 at the time, and this small amount of freedom was a really big deal to us. Nothing compared to walking down that street all by ourselves in the summertime, laughing and joking around a couple dollar bills in our pocket. I felt like I owned the world. The one oddity I ever noticed around the neighborhood was a small camper parked on the side of the road opposite to the gas station, right along the back side of the fence of another house. It sat there in the shade like a permanent fixture, all the windows constantly covered by opaque beige curtains. I can't explain why, but it always gave me this deep sense of foreboding when I'd pass it. I was almost positive someone was living inside it because, at times, I'd hear the air conditioner running as it sat stagnant in that same spot. The hairs on my neck would always stand on end as I passed it, particularly as I passed the camper door, and I'd always keep an eye on it for fear that one day, it'd just swing open just as I came to pass it. I think what bothered me the most was a drawing taped to the door from the inside. It was extremely messy, a sketch of odd lines in a brown-colored pencil that was frustratingly indiscernible. I could see the outline of something, a, a vague shape, but could never make out what it was intended to be. I never had the nerves to stop and stare long enough to really investigate, but each time I walked by, I'd steal a glance. A year prior to the incident I'm about to describe, I was walking with my mom past the camper in the shade. We had just gone to the park nearby and, unfortunately, had to pass the camper before we could cross the street and continue walking. I didn't want to seem afraid, so I kept on walking right behind her and didn't object when she walked past it. This time, I felt a little more brave. I was frustrated not being able to decipher the drawing for so long, and while my mom was feet away, I stopped in front of the camper door and and took a moment to really look at the drawing. Upon closer inspection, the paper was filthy. 
I remember doing a project in elementary school where we soaked printer paper and black coffee to make it look aged, and that's what it reminded me of. My mom walked on without noticing I'd stopped following her, but my eyes stayed fixed on the indistinct mass of dirt-caked scribbles until I could make out what looked to be a tiny, malformed face. My stomach turned. I immediately felt cold and disgusted as my eyes trailed over the rest of the image. I didn't know what kind of creature it was at the time, but now I can look back and say the drawing was a badly deformed fetus inside a mass of large, perfect circles, like those made by a circular ring roller. Its face was contorted as if in pain. It was so graphically disturbing and seemed to portray this odd sense of suffering that stuck with me for days. As a child, I didn't know how to process it, and the mental image still makes me sick to think about. I'd never seen anything like it before. Adrenaline flooded my body and my chest hurt with fear, but I selfishly thought of my glorious little trips for ring pops and said absolutely nothing as I followed behind my mom. That was, in retrospect, a classically terrible idea. It's one of those things you scream at main characters in movies for. Ever since my ill feelings towards the camper had been elevated by the drawing on the door, I thought about it every time we drove by. And about a month later, my mom once again graced us with several bucks and permission to walk down to Rotten Robbie and grab our respective snacks. I thought about telling my sister about what I'd seen on the way there, but she was older and braver and I was terrified she'd make me cross the street with her to check it out. It was a bright, sunny day and I told myself with false certainty that nothing was going to happen. If I didn't acknowledge it... Maybe it'd go away. We walked past the camper and it was thankfully uneventful. On the walk back, I was feeling more comfortable and was focused on fighting open my candy wrapper while my sister walked alongside me. We passed the camper a second time, but I didn't give it half as much thought as the first time. I don't remember what we were talking about, but I recall being interrupted mid-sentence as my sister softly yet firmly said my name. There was a distinct fear in her voice that immediately set me on edge, like a bucket of ice water. All my senses heightened and I became aware of everything, including the sound of haphazard footsteps about ten feet behind us. It was accompanied by a heavy rustling sound like a heavy backpack, and nervously I half-turned my head to look. A man with a long, unkempt beard and wearing many layers of ragged clothing stood behind us, eyes unmistakably burning into our backs as he walked. His movements weren't normal. It was a drunken shuffle, like each of his feet were unimaginably heavy and needed to be moved one grand effort at a time. His shoulders were skewed, head tilted downward with a strange arch of his neck. I could hear his shoes scraping the gravel with every step, but rather than seeming genuinely intoxicated, it was as if he was intentionally meandering our direction, like a zombie with the direct effort to frighten us. Behind him, I saw the camper door was wide open for the first time in all the years we'd spent living there and realized this was the man who had been living inside. He's following us! I choked out, my eyes filling with tears. My mind was spinning as I stared straight ahead again, the wide street and sidewalks abnormally empty all around. My sister grabbed my hand. She squeezed it hard enough to hurt without looking my way, speaking carefully under her breath. On the count of three, we race home. She told me in a very serious tone of voice. I couldn't reply through the growing lump in my throat, but every single cell in my body understood we had to put some distance between us and this man as quickly as possible. She began to count steadily while we walked faster, and the most terrifying part is that he started running before we even had a chance to. He must have heard her directions to me and tried to get a head start by sprinting our direction before she got to three, but his footsteps were noisy and we bolted like deer the instant we heard him behind us. I'll never forget it. The chase felt exactly like you'd imagine in your nightmares, the fear your pursuer is inches away from grabbing your arm or a fistful of your hair. I pictured myself being dragged into the van with nobody around to see or hear me. We ran so fast that we didn't even have the breath to scream, and peering back behind me about ten seconds later, I saw him running our direction with absolute none of the impairment he showed with those zombie-like steps moments before. I think back on it now, and he may have been deliberately pretending to be handicapped to lower our guard so we wouldn't start running. The thought is terrifying, but I can't rationalize it any other way. We made it to our grandparents' house and, without looking behind us, yanked open the stubborn old door before slamming it closed and scrambling past their excited dogs to get as deep in the house as possible. 
I don't even think we locked it, as our main goal was getting within the line of sight of any adults as quickly as possible. My mom was talking to my grandpa at the table and gave us an amused look when we bounded into the living room. Since we were kids, running around wasn't anything out of the ordinary, and she didn't ask what happened as we collapsed on the couch and tried to catch our breath. The inside of the house felt so safe and felt in such good spirits that I didn't even want to bring up what had just happened. Like waking up from a nightmare you didn't want to talk about, I was desperate to go back to normalcy. I wanted to forget about it entirely, to unwrap my candy and act like everything was completely normal for the sake of my own sanity, and that's exactly what I did. I asked my sister a few years back if she remembered this incident. I'm 25 and she's 28 now, and her response was strange. She remembered immediately, without the need for me to provide details, but she quickly waved it off and insisted he had to have been a bored homeless man looking to spook some kids walking home with no real intent to harm anyone. I don't know. I'd like to believe it's some innocent misunderstanding, but like they always say about gut feelings, they're rarely wrong. I feel in my soul that he wanted to hurt me and my sister that day. I never told her or anyone else about the strange drawing on the door, and... I'm not sure if my sister saw the open door and connected him to the camper or not. It's one of my biggest regrets, as I would hate for any other children to have been less fortunate after innocently walking past the camper in the shade. I believe he may have chosen the spot between the park and the gas station deliberately due to the number of children walking around the area. I never saw the camper again a day or so after this. I'm not proud of how I handled this, and would encourage anyone who finds themselves in a similar situation to contact authorities immediately for the safety of others around. I don't know if maybe this whole story comes off as melodramatic, but it was very real and very frightening in a way I can't forget. So, possibly deranged camper guy by the gas station? Whatever your intent was, let's not meet. Just a reminder that we take your true submissions. If you've had a terrifying experience and want to share it, leave us a message on our hotline at 701-712-8008. In our next experience, we hear from Reddit user The Deepest Regrets, with narration by yours truly. Sometimes, the drive home doesn't go quite as expected. This happened over 20 years ago. I was driving back home with my girlfriend at the time. It was Christmas Eve, and my mother's family used to hold a large celebration at my aunt's house in Escatada. This was my girlfriend's first time meeting with my extended family, but she got on quite well with them. We spent the majority of the afternoon and evening talking, playing poker, opening presents, and drinking an assortment of adult beverages. My girlfriend had been quite inebriated by the time we had to leave. Therefore, I'd be driving us home. It was around 11 p.m. or so. I was driving my girlfriend's car along Highway 211. Now, this stretch of road is surrounded by farms and dense patches of forest, and parts of it are unlit. But nothing to fear. I grew up in this area, so I knew this road like the back of my hand. The both of us were just driving and talking away, just two young lovers making the most of our moment together. There's a portion of the highway that descends down an enormous hill before crossing Deep Creek. Surrounding both sides of the road are thick forests. There are no lights. The only thing we could see was the area directly in front of our headlights. I drove down the hill, crossed the bridge, and uphill through more forest. It's as the highway starts to flatten out that it happens. 
something sprints across the road so suddenly that I almost hit whatever it was. I slam on the brakes. I turn to my girlfriend and ask her if she saw it. She confirmed that she had, but she couldn't make out what it was. Maybe it was a coyote, as they are a fairly common sight in this area. But something felt off about it. Whatever it was that ran in front of the car disappeared into the woods next to the road. Coyotes don't usually just dart out in front of cars. Not like that, anyway. So, for some reason, I decide to check it out. I turn the car around and switch on the high beams to better light up the forest in which this thing had vanished in. I step out of the car and walk towards the woods. I don't see anything. But now, it feels like perhaps I'd made a grave error. My heart is pounding, and the hairs on the back of my neck are standing at full attention. But I still don't see anything unusual in the trees. Suddenly, the car's horn blasts, long and blaring. I walk back into the car and ask my girlfriend why she had leaned on the horn like that. She said nothing. Instead, she pointed to a spot about 50 feet from where I was standing. I looked over in that direction, and that's when I saw it. Surely this was the thing that ran in front of our car. It was a man. He was completely naked. His skin was covered in dirt and mud, and in one of his hands, he was holding a hatchet. He looked back at us, and then he smiled and waved to us, just before turning around and walking back into the forest. Needless to say, we got the hell out of there. Once we were safely driving again, my girlfriend explained what had just happened. While I was trying to look for the man in the area he initially vanished in, he circled back around and came out from another spot in the forest, beyond my car headlights. My girlfriend had seen something out of the corner of her eye, and that's when she saw him. Before she honked the horn, he was walking towards me, his hatchet raised, as if making to strike me. We called the authorities once we got safely back home, but they never found anybody. Or, they did, and just didn't tell us. But the officer we spoke to explained his theory. The man was obviously looking to ambush unsuspecting lone travelers, for Lord only knows what reason. We all agreed that my girlfriend's quick thinking saved my life, as it let my potential killer know I wasn't there alone. I moved back into that area recently, so I now drive that highway often. No naked hatchet man sightings yet. But I can tell you that I'm definitely extra vigilant now, especially near Deep Creek. In our final experience, we're introduced to Reddit user Rose Gone Wild with narration by Addison Peacock. You never really know exactly who you will meet on a train. Short background story. I, 24, female, have been dating my boyfriend since I was 15. The first six years of our relationship have been kind of long distance. I used to go visit him on weekends, and it would take me around two hours by bus and train to reach the station where he would come pick me up. This story takes place when I was 18, so I was quite used to public transportation by then, and I was aware of the creeps and weirdos one would encounter when traveling. Nothing really creepy had ever happened to me, apart from the usual stares and unsolicited hello beautiful. One Saturday morning, I got on the usual train for the last 15 to 20 minutes of my trip, after traveling for an hour and a half by bus. I always tended to seat either close to other girls or to families with children. This one time the train carriage was quite empty, so I sat across from a young guy with flamingos on his t-shirt and a laptop. I don't really remember who the other people in our carriage were, that seat just looked like the safest one. 
Shortly after the departure, another guy entered the carriage and sat down next to me. He looked 25 to 30 years old. He was wearing some dirty old clothes and he smelled like sweat and possibly booze. He said, hi, and I said, hi. As I wrote before, I was quite used to weirdos talking to me on buses and trains, so I didn't immediately feel like I was in danger. In my experience, it was usually better to engage on a short and meaningless conversation than ignoring them completely. He asked what my name was, and I made one up. Then he asked why I was traveling all alone, and I said my boyfriend was waiting for me at the following station. I hoped this would be enough to make him desist, but I was oh so wrong. He started telling me that he had just gotten a new phone, and he had lost all of his friend's numbers. He asked me to give him my number so he'd have someone to talk to at night. WTF. I politely declined. At that point, I was starting to feel very uncomfortable, but my stop was only five to ten minutes away, and I still thought he was going to give up and leave. He insisted on me giving him my phone number and started getting closer to me. At this point, I stopped answering his questions and looked in the opposite direction. This must have bothered him because he suddenly put his dirty hand on my thigh to get my attention. I was terrified, but I managed to utter a shaky, don't touch me. I wish I had yelled it, but I didn't, and no one in the carriage noticed what was going on. Not even the flamingo guy who was literally in front of us. Or maybe he noticed and didn't care at first. That guy didn't take his hand off of me, and I was petrified. I don't remember if he said anything else at that point, because I was focused on his hand on my jeans. I gained some more courage and managed to tell him to leave me alone in a slightly louder voice. I guess some people started looking in our direction in that moment, because he suddenly got up and left. I started crying from the relief as soon as he exited the carriage. The flamingo guy asked if I was okay and if I needed him to call someone. I said I was fine. I tried to call my boyfriend, but he didn't answer because he was driving to come pick me up. I thought it was over. The train started slowing down, and I got up in order to get off. Little did I know that the creepy guy was most probably keeping an eye on me from the window of the carriage door after he left. I got off the train and started to look around, hoping to see my boyfriend, who would sometimes wait for me on the platform. At that point, I noticed that the guy had stepped off the train as well. As soon as we made eye contact, he started walking towards me. I felt my heart drop. I turned around and started walking quickly towards the stairs, hoping he would lose me in the crowd. As soon as I reached the underground corridor, I started running. I got to the other side of the tunnel. I ran up the stairs and towards the restrooms. I don't know why I didn't run to the main hall instead. I was panicking, and I just went for the first place that came to my mind. I locked myself into one of the cubicles made sure it was closed, and then got up on the toilet so he wouldn't see my feet. I was wearing a pair of quite recognizable boots. 20 to 30 seconds later, I heard someone come in and hastily try all the door handles. Of course, it could have been anyone, but I'm convinced it was him. It just made no sense for anyone else to try to open all the doors like that. I remember feeling my heartbeat in my throat while I was waiting for him to leave. I remained still and silent for what felt like ages until I heard him walk away. At that point, I started crying again, and finally managed to call my boyfriend and tell him I was locked into one of the toilet stalls. When he got there and I came out of the stall, I was shaking uncontrollably, but he somehow managed to calm me down. When we got out of the restrooms, there was no sign of the guy, and I never saw him again. Looking back now, I know I should have reported him to the authorities, but I stupidly thought that they wouldn't believe me or that they were going to shrug it off as not a big deal. After all, nothing really bad had happened on the train, and I had no proof that it was him trying to open the stall doors. This experience made me avoid trains for a while, and even though after some time I managed to overcome my fear, please, creepy guy on the train, let's not ever meet again. Before we end this week's show, I'm taking this time each week to read one of your reviews from Apple Podcasts. This week's review is from Pamela Boss. The review. 
I love it. I absolutely love strange stories and mysterious happenings. This is a great podcast, and I'm so excited for more. Thank you, Pam, for that review. For your chance to have your review read on the podcast, make sure you go drop us a review on Apple Podcasts or by going to disturbedpodcast.com slash rate. If you enjoyed this episode of Disturbed, consider supporting us as a premium listener. Find out more at disturbedpodcast.com slash fan club. Theme music for this episode by Kevin Hartnell. Special thanks to all the contributing narrators and submitters of these stories. You'll find all the relevant links in the show notes. You can see more info on our website, disturbedpodcast.com. Make sure you subscribe wherever you're listening so you always get the newest episodes automatically. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram at Disturbed Podcast and on Twitter at Disturbed underscore pod to stay up to date with all the latest Disturbed news. We'll be back next week with a brand new episode. Stay safe out there, y'all.